everyone. It's Gordon Einstein, uh, your semi-favorite, at least most available Dubai crypto attorney, continuing the series of hard-hitting interviews and discussions with people who matter in this industry, people who have an impact. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, James Glasscock, who I have known or known about, I should say, for I think over 15 years. Uh, when we traveled in similar circles in Los, back in Los Angeles back in the day. Uh, and when I reached out to him to see if we could you know, get something to spend or some of his time to, to talk on the interview. He brought up like a, you know, great hit, great hits from the nineties. It was a digital Hollywood and all these other places. It's just amazing. But, you know, he's working on several interesting things relating to crypto and blockchain. blockchain. So James, welcome on the show. Thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. Hey Gordon. You? Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, man. Yeah. Similar circles, 15, maybe 20 years. So hard to say exactly, but definitely those kind of late 2000s, I think, is when it began. That's a long time ago. Okay, yeah, never mind. I don't. I really don't want to think about that. So we're going to do what we always do on the show, which is we're going to give a little taste of what you're doing now, just so the audience knows where we're headed with all this. Then we're going to cover your background, which is fascinating, and kind of bring up to the present. Then we're going to have a very extensive conversation about some of my favorite topics. So just briefly, what are you doing now? Yeah, uh, these days I'm the head of ecosystem at a project called the Reserve Protocol. I was a seed investor in it about six years ago and joined the team full time about two years ago. Um, Reserve is a platform for anyone to create their own asset backed stable coins or flat coin products uh, all on chain. Asset backing is on chain. Um, programmable revenue sharing on chain over collateralization on chain. It's pretty cool. It's a, uh, it's a money system with no middlemen, no CEO. Um, everything's done in smart contracts and you can verify it on chain. Okay. Wow. There's a lot of impact there. Okay. So audience, we will come back to that because there's a lot to discuss about reserve protocol, stable coins, the future of money, everything else. Uh, but first James, where are you from? Where were you born? Yeah, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, grew up in Memphis. Uh, yeah, spent the childhood there, kind of years one through 18. A little bit of a troublesome childhood, like a lot of kids, I think, from like the Mid-South. Okay. But uh, it Do was... Do you want to uh, explain that a little? Since you, <laughs> you know, just, just your usual kind of like uh, not necessarily excelling in school and uh, mm -hmm. being the uh, the teacher's pet. But... um. I think it was kind of, Got it. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the usual mischief. Um, but yeah, I grew up in Memphis and uh, uh, pretty interesting experience. I think things got more exciting when I uh, I decided to join the military uh, right right out of high school when I was 18. Join the U.S. Range? Navy. Um, say that again. Uh, which branch? U.S. Navy. Navy. Oh, wow. Okay. And what did you do in the Navy? I was an electrician. I, I started out as an electrician on a guided missile frigate mm -hmm. and um, ultimately sort of rose through the ranks and ran the electrical engineering department on the ship. Um, this was kind of the era of gas turbine ships. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there had been a big shift from steam driven ships back about that, back, back in the 80s, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this was all happening for me in the 90s. Um, I mean, gas turbine ships are still a prominent feature of the U.S. Navy, uh, along with nuclear powered ships. Yes. Um, but yeah, did that in the early 1990s and learned a lot. And uh, that was that was essentially the first Gulf War. Um, and um, but 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 the military was like a really good, cool experience for me. Uh, it kind of gave me a few things uh, from a discipline standpoint uh, that I didn't quite get in the childhood. And, uh, you know, met a lot of interesting people, a lot of great mentors, actually. And uh, that kind of got me on my way into my professional career later on. Nice. And how long did you serve? Yeah, five years active duty. That's a good chunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was great. Nice. No, okay. Nowhere exciting, though. My... my a lot of times people who are in the Navy, they, they have these great trips of all the places they've been. Mm -hmm. uh, most of my time was spent in San Diego and Long Beach. And the ship we were on um, did a lot of circles in the middle of the ocean. You know, we didn't we didn't go to Japan and Philippines and Australia. 
uh, they call that a West pack, a Western Pacific cruise, uh, mm -hmm. where you just, you know, maybe go to 20 countries on a tour over six months. Um, our, uh, ship spent a lot of time doing drills on the ocean and, uh, um, also, uh, you know, a little bit of the drug war that was going on in, in Latin America at the time. Uh, we, we do lots of patrols, uh, down near, uh, Mexico and, uh, Nicaragua and places like that. Was it, was it guided missile cruiser? Yeah, it was, it was. We, we didn't use that set of weapons for that particular application. But, you know, back then the drug war was a topic. Uh, they leveraged the U.S. Navy along with the Coast Guard to, you know, hopefully help, uh, you know, kind of uh, put some friction out there for what was happening at the time. Um, but, you know, th th this type of uh, uh, ship capability is really designed for like, you know, actual war, um, which... Uh, all of my time, we were we were mostly just in the Pacific Ocean. This was during a desert storm, but uh, yeah. you know, people ask me, what were you doing during desert storm? And uh, I just tell them we were protecting the California coastline, not that it was truly in any risk, uh, just right. kind of more of a joke. You never, you never know. Uh, well, sure. I'll, I'll take the conversation very far afield, which is what do you think about the Red Sea and the Houthis and, and the drone and missile threat? That's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, right when I joined the military, um, when I was in the Navy, this was right after the USS Cole was attacked. I don't know if you remember. Of course, um, I, I, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was essentially, you know, kind of like a, a little boat with some, uh, you know, bombs on it, uh, TNT or something like that. I don't know specifically what it was. But um, but they blew a very large hole in the side of the ship. A few people got killed. Um, and a ship doesn't sink. Navy ships are designed with this idea of compartmentalization um, all throughout. So you have like watertight integrity. So you can have a large hole in the ship. You can flood that compartment, but it's actually sealed on both sides. So the ship can get itself home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think what's happening right now in the Gulf is... Um, you know, what, what I hear a lot about is they're using these very inexpensive drone equipment, um, you know, $5,000 drones, missiles on Navy ships. They kind of start, maybe the starting price back in the 90s was $200,000 on the low end, but easily you get into a million, $2 million per, per missile. Yeah. Um, so what I think what's happening right now is you've got... Um, uh, you know, a very advanced weapon system that's overbuilt for the type of warfare that they're dealing with, which is a bunch of cheap, you know, five, ten thousand dollar drones um, that can, you know, do damage. But uh, and and you can have a lot of them at a, at a fairly low cost. So uh, I, I suspect what will happen soon is the U.S. military will pivot in terms of its uh, hardware supply and, and try to meet uh, threats wherever they are, uh, you know, so that we're not wasting a million dollar missile for uh, things that it shouldn't be used on. Yeah, it's a challenge. It just, yeah. I mean, I know, you, you, just given your background, I mean, you, you, it, it must bear, it must bear in your mind a little bit. I mean, still, because it, I know it's five years, but it's probably a significant five years and things keep on evolving. It's, it's interesting. So when you, when you exit the Navy, uh, what did you do next? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, well, I went to work at KPMG. That was, uh, I'm sorry. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I just, I just skipped four years. I, I went to the University of San Diego, studied accounting. Um, and uh, yeah, decided to, uh, uh, originally I, I was on a chemistry track thinking I might take, uh, take interest in a role in the medical profession and, and then ultimately kind of recalibrated there and uh, came to a better understanding of the importance of accounting and law and decided to, you know, study accounting. Right. Um, yeah, spent four years doing that and a lot of little uh, side jobs to kind of help pay for getting myself through school. And uh, it was a great experience. Uh, San Diego, California is kind of one of the nicer places in the United yeah. States. Really pretty. Yeah, I love San Diego. Um, I used to go down there from the you know I was from Los Angeles and I used to go down there on the weekends. It's a beautiful place. Uh, so yeah. and then after that, oh, KPMG yeah, after so, 
KPMG was the first job out of school. Um, I, uh, I joined their Los Angeles office. It's funny, this was 1999. Um, and they had launched a digital media incubator <clears throat> right at the peak of the dot-com bubble. Okay. Which was, it, it's a, it's a cool sounding name, you know, the KPMG digital media incubator, mm -hmm. but it was part of the KPMG consulting group. And uh, what we spent a lot of time doing is developing business plans and helping startups launch, but they were often kind of very well funded for some reason, because they were able to pay KPMG. Not a lot of people can afford that. Not no. usually entrepreneurs cannot afford to pay KPMG. You know, that's something uh, that you do, you know, when you're a much larger company. Um, but uh, several projects. <clears throat> uh, yeah, well, the explanation is, um, uh, well, I, I wouldn't say it's the kind of it's the same fee structure of what people usually pay KPMG for, which mm -hmm. is, you know, uh, accounting work, um, you know, public accounting, audits, things like that, where. Uh, those can be quite pricey six figure, seven figure projects, depending on the size of the company. But yeah. at the time, you know, this was when KPMG Consulting and Arthur Anderson Consulting and Deloitte Consulting were were rising. You know, they had been, I think, all of them invented in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was just a specific area where they were focused on digital media companies. It was the dot com bubble. It's kind of like a lot like crypto, you know, where um, there was all this innovation happening, um, but people didn't exactly know where it was going to go. And, and in fact, there were. I remember it very well. I, I think you and I were in the same ecosystem at the same time. That's right. That that was, I think, where you and I crossed paths. Uh, I, I don't know if you ever went to the Vic at the Victorian. Yeah. yeah you know. Venice uh, Interactive Community back when it was. Yeah. hundred percent. That's and, right. Well, that that what was cool about that time, that was when like, you know, in Hollywood, in L.A., all the sort of script writers had put down their scripts and started writing business plans mm -hmm. and, and people were going out and raising money. I, I remember there was a company called Pop.com mm -hmm. that founded by Ron Howard, the director. Uh, they raised $50 million. They never even launched. They just spent all the money. Um, you know, the, the internet companies of those, of the nineties, they were, they were throwing these crazy parties and having really nice offices. They were, yeah. They weren't putting the money to good use. You know, it was definitely a lot like a crypto bubble era, which, you know, now we've seen a few of them. Um, and of course there were a ton of critics on internet companies as well. Uh, I remember in the 90s, actually, um, you know, when I was in college, I, I was an intern at a law firm called Milberg Weiss. They were notorious for securities litigation. I bet you might have heard of them. Um, the They did, um, you know, litigation against a lot of the tobacco companies in one. Mm -hmm. um, they did a lot of litigation against uh, lots of class action securities work. But I, I worked there as a forensic accountant. This was before I went into KPMG. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, you know, I'm working with all these accountants and, you know, people who sue people all the time. And uh, and Amazon stock was just kind of going haywire. It's going through the roof. Uh, and, and I remember uh, several of the folks there, they're like, Amazon's a fraud. This thing is going to go out of business. Uh, you know, this is not the right way to run a business and so forth. And, um, and and there was a lot of that mentality in the late 90s of how all of this new innovation was wrong or fraudulent mm -hmm. or being used for porn or, you know, things like that. You know, the Internet. It's kind of like what they say about crypto. It's used by criminals, right? The Internet yeah. is being used by criminals. Everyone's a criminal when you disagree with them. Yeah. And so, uh, and, and, you know, as the dot-com bubble burst, then... People thought for a minute, oh, see, I was right. You know, Amazon was, a, uh, you know, because the stock went from like $80 a share to like 70 cents a share uh, mm -hmm. in a very short period of time. And it didn't look like they might make it. But, um, you know, I, I, I love having gone through that experience and then gone through the FUD cycles of crypto, you know, the last three of them, where, every, where it's always the same set of headlines. Um, we kind of got, we've had three or four dot-com bubble bursts in crypto now. Um, so it's just a, like an interesting parallel to realize, you know, we we actually are all going to make it. Uh, you know, don't believe everything you read in the headlines. I'm pretty sure we're going to make it. You know, Bitcoin crashed 
to 65,000 today, heaven forbid. You, you, realize, yeah. you realize how crazy it is that this little thing is $65,000? I mean, it's you can buy a car for one of these, a, a decent car. It's not, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and, it's, and it's not like you've got, it's not like the tulips where it just did it once and then you never heard from it again. It's just revisiting where it was a couple of years ago. Nobody yeah, could. yeah. These no, are just no. blips. I, I tell people, you know, they, we, as humans, we, we want to judge something, you know, it, it's like human nature to pass judgment. Um, just so, you know, we're all trying to get our heads around what is this thing and trying like a model for what it is and how it fits into the system. Mm -hmm. But, you know, where crypto is right now is what I'd call like the 1994 internet, um, which up until about three months ago, crypto's penetration and monthly active users arguably was probably around 10 million monthly active users on, on the planet, which okay. is about the equivalent of the 1994 internet. So, you know, I think what, I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but what's really fascinating about this is, you know, this is the first time we've ever had a technology where there's kind of like this built-in speculation layer, right? Sure. Um, you kind of got a little bit of this with the internet companies of the 90s and the stock market, a but, but it wasn't native to the technology like crypto is. <clears throat> and because of that, it's allowed a bunch of other people to kind of come in and speculate on it at different points in time at different peaks and valleys, even mm -hmm. though the technology is arguably fairly immature, st even still today. Um, you know, if, if we did look at this in like the internet, the arc of the internet innovation, it really wasn't until about 2003 or four that, um, you know, kind of what I'd call the boomers realized uh, that the internet was here to stay. Mm -hmm. um, young people who grew up with it, you know, who, who maybe got there, was using a computer in high school or, or in college, um, for them, it was native. So they, they believed in it the whole time. But, but a lot of kind of the older uh, um, folks, you know, working in fintech or in business, it wasn't until like 2003 and four, you know, when five, when we saw like right. oh, Netflix streaming, that sounds interesting. Facebook, that's pretty cool. That's when people realize, oh, this is here to stay. Um, because after that bubble burst, a lot of people thought the internet was dead. And, you know, there were a lot of headlines leading up to that that said that would probably be the outcome. Uh, so it was kind of like Web 2. Uh, and, and by the way, it wasn't until about 2004 that the internet had 10% penetration on the planet. It sounds crazy to say that. And then it, you know, it went, well, you know, I mean, so you're talking about, I mean, 10 is actually a lot when you consider a lot of the world doesn't have electricity. That's right. It didn't have phone service. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, what, well, I think those are the, like the two big unlocks of the 2000s were broadband in the early 2000s. Uh, you know, some of us were lucky we'd get like a three megabit broadband connection in 1999 and we were so oh, happy. That's like two T1s. You, 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 that's you, right. That's an, right. An animal you. Yeah. Broadband, I think, in the early 2000s was a was a huge unlock. And then, of course, uh, mobile phones particularly touchscreen iPhones uh, mm -hmm. in the late 2000s, uh, you know, the iPhone moment, as they call it, another huge unlock. And and then, of course, about the same time, you could get these full feature phones for, you know, super cheap, like sub $100 and, and get those in all kinds of places around the world. Um, so um, we haven't had those moments yet in crypto, to be honest. Maybe yeah. some maybe in retrospect, we might look back and say the Bitcoin ETF was one of those moments. But I'm actually I'm not so sure about that. I, I don't think we've broken through with ease of use of the technology. Um, there's a lot of work to do there, uh, and and it'll be done. I, I think the comment. I, I think once a theory, once there's an Ethereum ETF, it's not it's and it's not Ethereum by itself. It's when there's both a Bitcoin and an Ethereum ETF. It's gonna have, I think it's gonna have societal and legal consequences because it's yeah. gonna desecuritize. Ethereum and everyone's eyes, it, it has to. Yeah. Right? And then once that happens, you, you, and you can have a transactional currency that grows in value, then it's going to, there's going to be some knock on changes after that. But the, maybe that's a whole different show. What, what, what was your involvement in the sort of digital 
ecosystem during this period before you got into crypto? Yeah, so um, you know, I, so I spent this time at the KPMG Media Incubator in 1999 and 2000, um, and then I joined a venture capital firm in Los Angeles called Zone Ventures. It was the Draper Fisher Jurvetson in, in LA. You might remember at the time they were doing this event called Zone Club, mm -hmm. and it was you know literally the coolest thing in town. Tech VC was not a thing in Los Angeles mm -hmm. until Zone Ventures. Uh, in, in, you know, around 2000, 2001, um, oh, yeah. we, we created an incubator, a technology commercialization incubator there that was focused on uh, working with like government R&D labs uh, and, and companies like Lockheed Martin, Rockwell Scientific, you mm -hmm. know, Lockheed built like the F-35, they built the SR-71. Uh, a lot of these government um, labs and, and aerospace companies they were building this very sophisticated technology for, you know, the Navy and the Air Force and, and so forth and government agencies. Um, and they had a, they were sitting on a massive trove of patents. So all of our time was spent on looking at patents and meeting with scientists in those labs and trying to figure out how to commercialize that technology into consumer applications. Um, that was also like a moment in time where incubators had just exploded in popularity. Um, you might remember at the time, Idea Lab sure. was, a, was a thing. It really set the tone um, and, you know, essentially gave us what Google Ads is today. You know, a company that was uh, created, I think, Overture and then sold to Yahoo and, you know, Google created their own and bought some companies. Um, but, but Idea Lab generated some of the most interesting companies of that era, um, its founder was was really sort of well respected in the space, and then about that same time, you saw in commercialization incubators pop up at Coca Cola, UPS, uh, VC firms, uh, military firms, all over the place, and and we were doing that same thing as well. It was a beautiful time. Uh, yeah, it was really. Santa Monica was popping. Yeah, and yeah. Clean. Well, <laughs> well, the interesting thing that happened is as we were building it. It, it started to turn into the wrong time to be building an incubator mm -hmm. because when the bubble burst, all the capital dry, dried up, right? And okay. and I remember, uh, you know, what the VCs would say at the time, they, they just went to play golf for four years. You know, uh, that was like kind of the, uh, the, 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 the little j giggle on the street about it. Um, and it was hard to get meetings for capital. Um, the, uh, this project was called, it was, it was an offshoot of zone ventures. It's called the zone reactor. Mm -hmm. Um, it had some success. We, one of the technologies we commercialized did come out of, um, Lockheed Martin. It was, uh, it's called fob Wadham, which is an interesting name, uh, which is just an acronym for fiber optic bus wave division multiplexing. It was a optical communications technology that they, they used on aircraft to replace all the copper thousands of pounds or hundreds of pounds to thousands of pounds of copper with fiber optics. Um, and uh, later on, we applied that technology to put into commercial aircraft. Um, what we didn't see coming, uh, and this was much later than my time is uh, Wi-Fi replaced the fiber, um, you know, wireless communications. It's but um, I know that's that interesting. Was, yeah, it was, it was a cool experience. Definitely got some, I saw the F-35 long before, uh, you know, which is, you know, one of the primary jets used by the Navy, Marines, and Air Force today, uh, many years before it was sort of fully approved. So it was cool working, uh, going over to Lockheed up in, uh, trying to remember, Palmdale, California. Yeah. Wow. And so it sounds like we're just commercializing, it sounds like we're just commercializing for, uh, consumers it sounds like there was a business in there also yeah yeah you know it, it's a huge stretch to make it work for consumers um the product that we developed was for airlines and aircraft manufacturers commercial aircraft manufacturers to retrofit uh existing aircraft and put these um you know lighter weight uh fiber optic communication systems in the aircraft mm -hmm. um looked at a lot of other types of technologies like uh you know like um like um being able to view through clouds uh i can't even remember the name of it but another fancy acronym that's actually 
quite used in a, in a lot of places. And, you know, these days, I think, well, Teslas are using video cameras to be able to look at cars around them. But yeah. um, there's, there's a bunch of technologies for this, uh, whether you're using cameras or some type of higher frequency technology to be able to see through, um, you know, uh, see down the road and make sure you don't, you know, hit anything uh, that you don't want to. That's important. Now, fast forward a little bit. What, did you come up, what was your crypto or blockchain epiphany? How did that happen? Yeah. Uh, oh, I skip one thing. Quickie. Sure. Uh, left Zone Ventures went to work in strategy and ops at Turner Broadcasting in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Turner, famous for launching CNN and TBS and a bunch of networks. That was cool. Uh, after kind of. After my stint with incubators and venture capital, I thought, hmm, I should probably get some operational experience because mm -hmm. what I spent all my days doing is trying to talk with people who had operational experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I was more of an analyst, not an operator. So I was like, I should get some operational experience. Yeah, so I, I went to Turner, uh, worked in their technology group, uh, went to Playboy TV, helped launch some of their video on demand networks. Video on demand was a new technology in the late 2000s. Yeah. Um, cable companies like Time Warner Cable and uh, satellite companies like DirecTV were launching these services all around the world. Um, yeah, did that until about 2011 um, and did a lot of other things kind of like in Hollywood, you know, help with some film productions, things like that. But I, you know, I had the luxury of having a, a friend community who were early Bitcoin adopters. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. Oh, geez, you know, founders of Tether. Um, uh, Are we talking about uh, Craig? Uh, that's right. Craig, Craig and Brock, William, yeah. Brock, um, Reeve. Uh, yeah. Yeah, all those guys. Uh, friends of Michael Turpin. Um, and, um, uh, and, and you know, uh, some of them would be on Facebook every day in 2011 and 12, ranting about Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And and I finally, uh, I was like, okay, I should probably check this out. And so finally, by the end of um, 2013, <clears throat> I, uh, you know, this was, Bitcoin was peaking again. Um, I think Bitcoin reached $1,000 in January of 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe even December 2013, which was the top at the time. Um, six months later, it had dropped 80%. Uh, you know, this was the Mount Gox hack, I think, happened yep. in like February 2014. So, you know, I finally uh, succumbed and, and bought myself in at the top of the market. And I was like, cool, let's check this out. <clears throat> and it, it was wild. Back then, you... Uh, you had to, you filled out a form on a website, you sent a wire to some people mm -hmm. and uh, two or three weeks later, uh, I think I got like a, a hardware, uh, a, a Bitcoin private key in the mail. Uh, I, I got it through snail mail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I got, yeah. They didn't email it to you. You got it in the mail. Um, and, uh, that's how I bought my first Bitcoin. It's crazy. Um, wow. and, uh, uh, and then of course, six months later, you know, I, I think I bought it at like 11 or 1200 and six months later, it was like 250. And, and, and I was like, man, that's, that's not great. <laughs> that's um, not, I'm done with this forever. Bitcoin is going to fail. Yeah, seriously. Well, you know, it's funny, right about that same time, Coinbase had launched this ability to drip into an account. Mm -hmm. a few hundred bucks a month you know you can drip whatever you want 20 bucks a month if you wanted i, I think you could do 20 bucks a month mm -hmm. but uh but i decided i was like oh let's 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 check this out this this could be something i i think i've always like been intrigued by underdogs you know um and so that that's kind of how i started got into bitcoin it's actually similar story is how i got into ethereum which was right after the dow hack you know ethereum's price was I think Ethereum's price was maybe like seventy or hundred dollars before the Dow hack, mm -hmm. but it you know it happened and then it it tanked you know it dropped to like fourteen, um, and I was like oh cool I think I'll buy some of this too um, you know and uh, and that, that's how my that's how I started getting educated on like the digital asset space I I like to learn by doing yes and. Um, I didn't really get super aggressive about the learning part until about 2016.
you know, started seeing the prices tick up on things. And, and I was like, oh, wow. And, and you know, I'd been accumulating. Actually, I say, let me break in for one second. So you made a comment a few minutes ago that it's interesting that crypto has the speculation layer almost built in, despite the fact that the technology, I think everyone would agree, isn't right. But I, I, I think I agree with you. And I think that's great because even if the speculation is premature, it catches people's interests in a way. The fact that you have crypto when it goes up and down and fluctuates, you can potentially like make a lot of money or lose a lot of money. It, it yeah. captures the ADHD interest of the world long enough that the technology gets dragged on behind it. And even That's when right. people lose interest, they, you know, every single day it's getting a little bit better. And so, so what if you know if there's a crest of speculation a little bit ahead? It, to me, it's mm -hmm. fine. It's just keeping people's eye on the ball. Whereas if yeah. you have some technology that takes ten years to go public or show something. I mean, you could you could design Bitcoin in a think tank and made it perfect, but no one would do anything with it because no one would know about it. It wouldn't be adopted. It's it, it's the speculation that it drives adoption. So it's I, to me, it's fine. It's, I, I like yeah. It. It's really important, you know. Sometimes you'll see some critics on crypto Twitter and other places. They'll be like, "Bitcoin's been around for fifteen years and nobody's using it." And what you know so to your point though what's happening is the adoption and the excitement is happening at a faster rate because of that speculative layer yeah but but the funny thing is 15 years is not a very long time right the the internet really people didn't get excited about it until about 1994 or 95 but the earliest iterations the invention of it was like the late 60s right so that's uh that's like um 20 years um you look at automobiles invention late 1800s yeah. people didn't really get excited about it till the kind of 1915 to 1925 era 20 25 years uh, maybe 30 years I, I haven't done the math on it and so those cycles from invention to adoption to widespread adoption it takes a long time actually uh i don't actually think crypto is going to take that long at all um, you know, here we are at, well, I guess we're maybe we're at the 16 year birthday uh, nearby for Bitcoin pretty soon. Yeah. Um, uh, this will all happen on a much sort of accelerate. I'm a big fan of, you know, Ray Kurzweil and something he calls the law of accelerating returns, which is sure. how everything is happening at a much faster pace uh, here in the future than it did, you know, 50 years ago or 100 years ago or whatever. And so I think we'll see the same thing with digital assets. It won't take the, the commercialization and adoption of digital assets will not take as long as the commercialization and adoption as, you know, the Internet, the first generation Internet. I, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll, I'll do a little bit. OK, when people say that, that Bitcoin is not being used yet, I say they're misunderstanding what's going on. Yes, it's marketed as digital cash. Yeah. And in the layperson mind, they associate cash with spending cash. They don't really associate cash with holding cash. Yeah. But, but the mere act of buying Bitcoin is using it. You don't need to send it to someone else either. Now, why? You know, you, you don't keep cash underneath your mattress because of inflation and because of theft and because of damage and everything else. If if you weren't nervous about about inflation and you weren't nervous about um, theft, or fire, you would keep cash under your mattress. You wouldn't yeah. have to put it in a bank. Why put it in a bank if you're not getting any interest and the government can take it? You know, so the the act of hold of being able to hold onto the value by holding Bitcoin, we, we've already adopted it. Anyone who owns Bitcoin is, is using it for its use already. Yeah, that's okay. right. So I, I say mm. it's already working now. I mean, I'm. I think everyone knows, you know, I got some and I'm very happy that I do put me in a completely different situation in life. And, the, you know, I'm not saying anything that people don't know, but, you know, the, the, it, it wasn't the spending of it that put me there. It was the acquiring and, and holding it. So, you know, whoever says that on crypto Twitter, I think is a non-holder who hates life. And they're just well, angry. I think something that's interesting that you're talking about is basically a paradigm shift in thinking, Right. We and it's funny, there's a societal norm that defines what cash is and that you should go spend it. Yeah. Why is that a good idea? Like, you know, it, like that's actually kind of an issue. All of this sort of 
unproductive consumerism, we are entertaining ourselves with, uh, you know, let's just go shop, let's go spend, let's, you know, let's blow it. Um, uh, you know, it, it depends on- as leisure. leisure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know another form of leisure. It's called, let's go hiking in the mountains uh, and you don't need to spend any money. Uh, you know, let, let's go skiing. It, it could require a little money. But um, there's, uh, it is Especially funny, now. this sort of societal paradigm design. And, you know, when you when you travel to somewhere like Japan or, or other places, there's built around running you up and down escalators to go shopping. You know, um, I get it. Some people are super into it. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm kind of bored there, to be honest. Uh, you know, I'd rather do something out in nature and, uh, you know, uh, my Bitcoin, I prefer to hold it, not spend it. So, uh, yeah, I I hold it, it and keep it warm at night. So, I, yeah. I, I want to make sure we have enough time to talk about your reserve protocol. Yeah, so, yeah. Is there, let, let, let's just dive into that because there's a lot of meat there, if that's okay. So, yeah, that'd be great. Well, what, 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 what is it? And what, number one, mm -hmm. what is it? And number two, what was the inception for the idea? <clears throat> the what is it is, a platform for anyone to create their own asset backed stable coins or flat coins or index products on chain. Okay. What makes reserve protocol really interesting is you can build all these products um, in a decentralized way and there's no middlemen. Um, uh, things that are on chain here are asset backing or is locked in a smart contract on chain. It's transparent. It's verifiable. Um, Revenue sharing is programmable on chain, um, which is exciting, right? So you could build something like what Tether or Circle have built, mm -hmm. um, except, you know, th those are centralized stable coins and they kind of keep all the money for themselves, right? Kind of like a Web2 company, essentially. Um, yeah. But the future of this is you can build an on-chain product. <clears throat> you could program the revenue to go to 100 different places. And when I say you could program it, I mean the community, because there's no individual who controls that. What's fascinating about that? Well, there is no CEO and there is no office, right? It's stakers coming together to make choices uh, around what should be in the collateral basket. Where should the revenue sources go? Should the revenue go to the holders of the stable coin or should it go to a DAO or should it go to charity? You can do all of these things. It's programmable. Um, and then <clears throat> these asset backed currencies on the reserve protocol, they all have an over collateralization fund, kind of like for, you know, bank runs and black swan events. It's actually been battle tested last year on March 10th when there was a run on Silicon Valley Bank and a subsequent DPAG of USDC. And, and, and the many stable coins dependent upon that relied on a regulators to backstop the bank, which occurred about uh 40 hours after it happened about almost two days later and then the banks to reopen on the monday after that um the difference is these asset backed uh stable coins on the reserve protocol they have a kind of a self-healing capability mm -hmm. where they can detect the dpeg event get rid of the failing collateral buy a backup collateral and slash a staking pool and return to peg without human intervention that's pretty cool uh, I, 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 I just got to ask if you're getting out of the failing collateral, are you, are you compounding the issue affecting that collateral? Um, you, uh, let's see, are you, yeah, I, I'd say you probably are, but, the, but you have a choice to make, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, uh, are you protecting your stakeholders who are holding the stable coin? Uh, and when I say you, the you in this is the, is the 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 smart contract? Right, yeah, right? I, I wasn't implying this wrong. I just want to understand the, me yeah. the mechanics. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you know, you're, you're kind of joining the bank run, and maybe you should because the bank's really going down. You you, you don't know. Get out. Yeah, you don't know if it's going to zero or if it's only going down eleven percent. I I remember on Saturday, March tenth, uh, a lot of people were really worried. Like, is USDC going to zero? Will we be able to recover our funds? In retrospect, there's a lot of folks that would say, well, of course it would have been backstop. Of course it would have been safe. But th that's not, you can go read the governance forums for ENS DAO. You're not going to find a course. You're going to find panic uh, because a lot of DAOs were sitting on USDC 
and they were locked into multi-day governance processes to even be able to get rid of it. Yeah. Uh, they were really worried about it. Um, and, you know. Well, that's uh, an interesting point, actually. The, 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 probably the safety measures they had to make sure their governance mechanisms weren't misused prevented them from right. nimble in the event of a defect. That's right. That's right. Wow. And, and so, you know, that's what's cool actually. about pre-programmed asset-backed stablecoins in the reserve protocol is there's already backup collateral specified when it's originally deployed, right? And so it can go through these motions and survive those types of events. But but yeah, that's that's what the reserve protocol enables. There's so far there's been about we call these R tokens, mm -hmm. uh, these asset backed currencies. These R tokens and they can be programmed to peg to a U.S. dollar. They can peg to the price of Ethereum. They get pegged to the basket of of assets, right? You could you could do a uh, an index of um, DeFi tokens like uh, you know Uniswap and Maker and uh, you know Synthetics and and so forth. You could build a basket of popular DeFi tokens. You could build a basket of popular meme coins if you want to. You put some Dogecoin and some Shib and some other things like that in there. You know, if you wanted a, a kind of a meme coin index, you could build that on the reserve protocol. Um, today, there's a, let's see, we, we just hit about 100 million in TVL about a week ago, which right. is exciting. Protocols live on Ethereum mainnet and um, and on the base uh, L2. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, just building out uh, the ecosystem, you know, inviting. So what's their, you're, you're implying something, what's their goal? Like one, two, three, yeah. four years, years out. Where are you headed? <clears throat> Well, the ultimate goal that would be pretty exciting is to be able for someone to be able to build a reserve currency mm. backed by a basket of inversely correlated assets, like a hundred different assets, real world assets, you know, mm. things like uh, real estate and commodities, stocks, bonds, crypto, very diverse basket of assets. You know, today, how we understand inflation is in a centralized kind of published way, right? Someone has decided to say mm -hmm. the inflation rate is whatever, 3%, 10%. You know, it's not necessarily um, tied to a basket of assets, which was kind of the original definition of it. Um, what's possible in the future, though, is you could have a basket of assets mm -hmm. that properly balanced could give you a true rate of inflation and could be stable over centuries or longer. Um, whereas- Is zero rate of inflation or true in the sense of accurate? It would be accurate inflation. Accurate okay. based on the value of a basket of assets, a very diverse basket of assets. So you could have a, a currency that's just more stable over a longer period of time. Also that currency would be outside of the control of any type of tech company uh, or any type of political influence mm -hmm. uh, because it would be governed by a community of stakers, right? So um, okay, no, you wouldn't be able one. to fund a war with it, that's for sure. Oh, there's a lot to do kind of here. Well, actually, before yeah. I, well, it's top of mind, so let me ask. The, the governance, when you were describing it, the governance kind of stuck in my brain a little bit because I, I guess this is a roll your own coin or stable coin or, or asset backed reserve currency and you're i think i'm hearing you say that the governance of this is via the community how do you define the community or how can they define the community yeah there's a there's a governance token in, in the reserve protocol it's called reserve rights and okay. specifically what that is used for is holders will stake on a specific r token so you can choose which r token to stake on and govern on you can't govern an R token if you're not staking on it. Why do they want to stake on it? They want to stake on it because number one, they want to participate in governance. Mm -hmm. Number two, they are also playing a really important role, which is they are the first loss capital in the event of a DPEG event, right? So they're providing over collateralization. And then number three, why do they do that? They're doing it because they're getting a share of the revenue of the yield on for that stable coin. So that's how the kind of governance token is designed for each R token. And because R tokens are permissionless, anyone can create them. If you're a reserve rights, you know, an RSR governance token holder, you want to be careful about where you stake and govern, right? You don't want to lose your money. You want to 
probably make money, you know? Um, so uh, they're making choices about, you know, hey, I like this art token because it's launched by a docs team and they have some integrations and they have some safe collateral in the basket that I can verify on chain versus maybe another project that's got some really questionable collateral um, and maybe the team is, uh, you know, a bunch of anons, uh, nothing wrong with anonymous teams, but, you know, usually more information, more disclosures makes a project a little more exciting to more people. Um, and so essentially what you have I, happening. I, the, the rebel in me, I'd say not necessarily. I kind of wish Tornado Gaps had been more anonymous, you know, <laughs> and yeah. I think it depends what you're doing. Yeah, well, there and there's. Clearly, anon projects are are progressing. You know, it's I think this is just another facet of society right now that people are finding anonymity to be a feature, not a bug, in terms yeah. of being able to kind of focus on the most important things. You know, we we do live in this society of paradigms. You know, we talked about paradigms earlier, like with how people think about cash. The same goes for, you know, identity. And, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of moving out of, you know, from my perspective, we're moving out of a society of credentials and into a society of what have you done lately, you know, on chain, you know, that can be verified by anyone. Um, uh, you know, will that be, I don't know. Right? Ethos. You know, it doesn't yeah. matter what your degree is from, what, what's your most recent <clears throat> repo? Yeah. But, but back to governance in the reserve protocol, there's there's tens of thousands of RSR holders. So one of the cool things about deploying on the reserve protocol, you can bootstrap a governance community pretty quickly just by choosing the yield in your asset backing of the basket, because that's what attracts those stakers to come over and participate and govern. And as these asset backed stable coins grow in popularity or, or any financial product or ecosystem or innovation grows in popularity and you know there's kind of a, a larger honeypot it attracts people who want to come and participate in it and you know be a part of what's happening there um and we're seeing that already uh you know with a few of these art tokens okay and then the, so it, it, would, you, would you describe the governance community i i, I understand the mechanics of it would you just describe it as a dao or dao-esque or <clears> anything else yeah, it's a great question. So it's funny, we don't call them DAOs, you know, there's a, uh, but each R token is the literal definition of a decentralized autonomous organization. Yes. There, there is no, the, the organization is independent stake, you know, choosing to stake on and govern and participate in. It's, it's really one of the most elegant definitions of a DAO but none of them kind of go around talking about Dow, 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 Dow. It, it, it just, you know, and it's funny, we've kind of come out of this era of kind of the last wave of everything was going to be a Dow and lots of innovations around Dows. Um, no. We don't call them Dows, but, but, but they actually are, you know, it's just not the selling point of it. it it's, um, uh, it, it well, just, I mean, you maybe it's a Dow. It yeah. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. But it, okay, so if, you, if, if someone wants to change something, they're there, they're thinking, you know, they got the garden token, mm -hmm. they making an on chain proposal, or what, what's how's that going? Yeah, yeah. The governance process is they'll put up a RFC, a request for comment in the discussion forums for three days, mm -hmm. get some comments on it, build some coalitions, build some support in the community. Um, and if they get a lot of positive support, they can then choose to put it into an on-chain proposal. They can do it or they can choose not to do it. Or someone else can put the on-chain proposal. It is decentralized. Once the on-chain proposal goes up for vote, I believe that's also another 72 hours. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, stakers then need to vote. There's a couple of proposals that are live right now in the reserve ecosystem. People are voting on. Needs to get to its quorum. Um, and once the proposal's passed, then there's a series of events to like implement uh, what that proposal is. And so right now, some of the proposals that are on chain are <clears throat> changing the basket of some of these R tokens to safer assets or to higher yielding assets. 
Uh, and then sometimes the governance um, uh, on-chain proposals are a little more technical, like moving to a different structure for the auctions uh, on the protocol, uh, you know, in the event of changing the basket or uh, in the event of some type of bank run event or something like that. There's a bunch of um, customizable parameters for the reserve protocol that can only be changed. They can be initially set up by the person who deploys the R token. But once it's deployed, it can only be changed through governance, public governance. And that you know that's where you need stakers to vote. Um, and so that's what's happening right now with several R tokens. Once they're launched, they are not controlled by any individual. Next question. So if a vote goes through, is there sort of an automatic publishing of a new smart contract? <clears throat> What's the actual implementation mechanism? Yeah, uh, we're, we're getting into super technical territory. Uh, I'll do my best on, on the answer. Okay. Um, but, but anyone who's interested in this should just drop into the reserve discord and we'll, we'll ask the engineering team to, to, to get in on that. Um, usually these uh, governance changes are switching uh, to a different collateral plugin. Um, uh, so, you know, right now, um, so, so all of the collaterals on the reserve protocol, the best collaterals are yield bearing. Why is that? Because that yield bearing collateral is what provides the revenue source for the stable coin to be able to share revenue to a bunch of sources. So yeah. instead of using naked tether as a asset backing, they'll use something like Ave tether or compound tether, which are yield bearing forms of tether. Um, and, and to be able to do that, a collateral plugin has to be built for the reserve protocol. What is a plugin? It's just a wrapper around the asset that allows the protocol to harvest the yield from the asset. Um, when I, when I call something Ave Tether, specifically what I mean is someone actually I'll, I'll do, um, I'll do compound USDC because I just deposited some a week ago. Right now, a week ago, I deposited some USDC in Compound, and I'm earning 18% yield on it. Pretty cool, cool savings account right there. Um, and, and this is this is a thing that you and I will have to have an offline conversation about that because that's very interesting. Okay, it's 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 crazy, you know, the yield. But but look, it's it's DeFi, it's Compound. There's a lot of people who don't want to do that. It seems a little scary, and you got to do 10 clicks. To yeah. kind of get into the position, I'm I'm exaggerating. It's not ten; it's maybe three or four. But but so out of that, the user gets a receipt token from Compound, which is they can you know it's I can give you the receipt token, and now it's yours, and yeah. you can it's bearer. It's a bearer instrument. Um, once you have that that receipt token, the other cool thing you can do with that receipt token, though, and this is happening all over DeFi is you can put those in the asset backing of a stable coin. And now you have a diverse basket of yield bearing collateral. It's a, it's, it's Ave wrap, I'm sorry, it's compound wrapped USDC in the example that I'm talking about, which is a great collateral. USDC, aside from the bank run last year, is a pretty good stable coin, right? You know, when I, you I, think, I even argue it's it. stronger because the bank run, because look what happened. Sure, that's right. That's right. Right, it, it has been stressed that it's not Luna. Yeah, and then the compound protocol has never been hacked, and in fact, it's been forked many, many times. Mm -hmm. So it's a very trusted protocol. You know, these what we're doing here in DeFi and in crypto is is we want to use things that have Lindy effect. It's been used for a long time with no hacks, and you know, uh, and it's fairly stable, right, and resilient. I mean, that's. That's kind of what people believe about the U.S. dollar, right? It's kind of worked for a few hundred years, although some of us would say, hey, I see a lot of fractures with this thing. Uh, it's not really, and, and we look at the history of currency, right? We know that empires fall eventually. It's just, it's not a question of if, it's more of a question of when, you know, is it? Yeah, well, I, I think I think years, pretty soon. But yeah, five years, 50 years, 500 years, I don't know. But it, it, it probably won't, uh, it's not going to last forever. I don't know why it would. Um, but yeah, back to the reserve protocol. So these, uh, to, to be able to put uh, yield bearing uh, compound USDC in a basket, someone's got to build a collateral plugin for it. Uh, anyone can build these collateral plugins. 
-hmm. And essentially when an R token is switching its basket, it's switching to, you know, that new collateral plugin. I, I actually, I'll, I'll give you a uh, little bit of alpha here. Uh, they just, uh, I believe some PayPal USD collateral plugins were built like this week. Uh, and so um, that's pretty exciting. Uh, so you're going to start to see PayPal USD and collateral baskets, um, uh, a number of other really interesting assets uh, also uh, that will be used in collateral baskets going forward. Interesting. All right, so let, let, let me ask some contrarian devil's advocate type questions. Um, why shouldn't I, why do we need res, uh, reserve protocol when I can just do USDT or USDC? Yeah, it depends on what you value. Um, the cool thing about programmable money is <clears throat> you can make money that achieves different goals for different groups of people. Um, if you want the deepest liquidity stablecoin on earth with the most trading pairs, Tether is unrivaled now and will probably be unrivaled for years to come. Uh, I don't know about a decade from now, but for sure the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, that's what Tether's really good at. Um, uh, and, and you know, the people who love Tether, I think they like it because it it's... Uh, it doesn't touch U.S. bank rails. Some people don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, they call it the freedom stable coin, so I've been told. The people right. who like USDC mm -hmm. uh, tend to be a little bit more U.S. institutional regulatory aligned, right? Uh, transparent, a little bit more transparency aligned. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what people like about USDC. And of course, USDC uh, does have some favorite alignment and distribution within the Coinbase ecosystem, the BlackRock ecosystem, and you know we'll see what happens after that. Um, people like DAI uh, because it is decentralized and you can deposit assets like ETH and other stable coins to be able to mint DAI. So you can, mm -hmm. you can deposit crypto without selling it, right? And you can, you know, uh, meant uh, yeah. stable coin. You can go spend that. You can go buy yourself a boat or buy yourself more crypto. That's a pretty cool value prop. Why? Why now? What else would people be looking for in stable coins? Well, some people are going to be looking for yield bearing stable coins. Um, you take places like Nigeria and Argentina, um, particularly Ni Nigeria and a lot of underbanked countries, Venezuela, where people don't have access, Lebanon. They mm -hmm. don't have access to good banking services. Um, what you can do on the reserve protocol is you can build a yield-bearing flat coin that throws off 6 to 10% yield to the holders just by holding the digital asset. They can hold it in any wallet, any centralized exchange. Uh, they can hold it in a self-custodial wallet. They can hold it anywhere. You don't need uh, you know, to have a bank account to be able to hold it. And, you know, I live in the United States. We have, you know, banks on every corner, but there are a lot of places in the world that don't have that. And they're suffering from hyperinflation. You know, they have countries that are printing too much money. And, and I think the latest numbers are there's about four or five countries with inflation over 100 percent. And there's about another 20 countries with inflation over like 20 or 30 percent. So that's very painful in those places, um, and where that's where. Sorry, I, I, I think you're making a stable point argument. Um, give me the USDT versus reserve protocol argument, as it applies yeah. to what you're saying. Well, so the reserve protocol allows you to create all kinds of stable coins and flat coins. You can create yield bearing stable coins. You could create um, stable coins that have a built in savings account for people that want to stake it. Um, you could build um, uh, you could build these stable coins that have programmable revenue distribution to charities. You know, if you wanted to say, let's call it. Uh, I, I see what you're saying. Dollars. So it, yeah. it, 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 you kind of fulfilling the promise of what Bitcoin was supposed to be in the sense that it's programmable internet money. Yeah, I, I think. I think though the thing about Bitcoin is it is programmable money, but it's it's programmed, period. And and yeah. you know the programming might change. You know they might change kind of a couple of things to increase its security. But but Bitcoin is not going to be all things to all people. Bitcoin's strength is it does one thing really good. It it is the best in the world at what it does right now. 
Uh, and, it, and who knows, it might do some more things later. And, and now we've got ordinals and there's a whole Bitcoin DeFi ecosystem happening. So we'll see about that. But what, what you can do with reserve protocol, which is just really a kind of a different animal, is you can create these bespoke current. You, know, um, you don't have to have a, uh, a global reserve currency in a world where you can trade any digital asset for any digital asset in real time. Uh, the reason the U.S. dollar, I'd, I'd call U.S. dollars and, you know, Tether and USDC are just digital versions of this. Mm -hmm. I'd call them industrial age money, which is, which is, you know, it's a great, it was a medium of account, a unit of exchange and a store of value. Those are great functions to solve in the, uh, the early 1900s. But now you have money that can do so much more than that. It can share its revenue with the holder. Um, you can actually have transparency on like where are the reserves stored and what's the counterparty risk of those reserves. Even though USDC is was kind of considered the, a blue chip stablecoin up until March of 2023, um, we learned pretty quickly that the counterparty risk was fairly concentrated and at substantial risk. And that won't change much in the future. Of course, they're taking steps to mitigate that. But now, you know, what you yeah, what you can do with an on-chain currency is you could back it with a basket of 100 assets. And some of those assets can go to zero and the stable coin can survive that. Um, it's designed for that level of resilience because you have an over collateralization fund to protect against those events for a little part of the basket. Um, you know, honestly, it's it's come full circle to the the old adage of don't put all your eggs in one basket. We're moving into a place with things like the reserve protocol and other people who might try to enable this where um, like we're just following the rules that, you know, maybe our, our mothers or our grandmothers taught us uh, a long time ago. Uh, you'll hey, be able to do you're, that. You're getting things. algorithmic diversification. And like I said, <clears> yeah. And, and, yeah, well, and again, I'm, I'm just being devil's advocate, throwing out counter examples. So you can no, knock them down. So you made a good distinction with Bitcoin. He said it's not programmable money, it's programs of money. I, I thought that was good. Let, let me throw yeah. CD, um, central bank digital currencies. Yeah. What's, what's bad? How do they compare? Well, you know, CBDCs mean a lot of different things to different people. Um, depending on which government, you know, is launching theirs, they have a different definition. I've seen CBDC specs, design specs, where there's a there's an entire zero knowledge. Uh, proof layer around privacy. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, CBDC is kind of like a lightning right, like it means the government, right? So immediately, everybody kind of hates it, <clears throat> and probably should. Uh, you know, kind of governments aren't exactly the epicenter for innovation. Right. Uh, or privacy. You know, that's, not, that's not where it's going to come from. Uh, but, you know, if a government wanted to launch a CBDC, uh, and they needed a to, and they didn't want to build a, a protocol from scratch, you could easily build it on the reserve protocol. Um, the thing is, uh, and they could fork the reserve protocol and they could they could change the governance entirely. They don't have to use reserve it's rights. Right. Is, is, is reserve open source? Yeah, that's right. Anyone so can fork it. It's all on GitHub. I could just fork it right now if I wanted to. That's right. That's right. Good. Okay, great. Yeah. Good. You'll, you'll lose some of the network effect of the capability, uh, I'm sorry, of the community. Um, you know, there's definitely some benefits to having a built-in governance layer and, and a really elegant design, but you could do that. You could you could centrally, gov you could fork it and, you know, I don't know, some government could probably come up with their own form of wanting to control it. Uh, but then who who's going to use that? You know, uh, I think what's exciting- uh, I, I was mostly getting at, all the code is open source, available that's right. open source license. That's, what, uh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Um, I mean, I, I haven't looked at uh, what the license is, but you can go fork the code if you want to. Uh, uh, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I, I don't even know if that's been addressed. You know, here, here's Lucky a you. license. Okay. You can fork it for free or whatever. But I can tell you, <clears throat> none of us are focused on how to make fees off of people forking the protocol. We're focused on making a protocol that um, that people want to use, that they love, and and it's immutable. You know, the smart contracts that are on chain right now, uh, there's no uh, there's no one in control of. Them. They have Pauser, 
and freezer functionality by the community. Um, but you know, we don't, those are mutable smart contracts. But I think you're going for it. It's, you know, I, I remember a few years ago, everyone was talking about community points and yeah. it was <clears throat> for better, or for worse, faded. Uh, I think the idea of creating a bespoke asset back, you know, de facto DAO governed coin with, with these, you know, with the over collateralization and the governance mechanisms can enable communities to form where they couldn't have before. You know, I kind of like to see some American Indian tribes set up their tokens or coins on reserve. I think it'd be a good idea. You know, it would be- Yeah, I, I think ahead. it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Um, and, and, you know, this technology didn't really exist five years ago, yes. but, but community currencies have always been a thing. It just hasn't been easy to do. You know, we historically, before digital, we needed a shelling point in the world around what's the best reserve currency everybody like, and everyone kind of likes US dollars. Yeah. But now we're moving into this space where you can trade any digital asset for any digital asset, and it can be stable, and it's not controlled by some individual. And, and that's kind of important um, because that means you can trust it um, you, uh, if it's, if it's run by smart contracts instead of, you know, someone who has a political motivation or uh, some type of corporate interest, uh, in, in the outcomes, um, that's really the power of community governance. And so every social network, every video game, every metaverse can have its own stable currency. And, and, you know, you and I saw this five years, six years ago, everyone's having their ICOs. They were launching their own currencies. But the problem is volatile money is not a good use of money. It's not a good money. It's not money. It's a medium of exchange because you don't know if it's going to be worth zero tomorrow or, or double. You can't really run an economy on volatile money. You need stable money for that. Um, and now, you know, anyone can create their own. So that's fascinating. And, then, and b before we started recording, I, I kind of threw out there Libra and Facebook. And you said something interesting, which is it wasn't such a bad idea, it wasn't so badly executed. Because, you know, to, to my recollection, Libra was based on a basket of currencies and reliable debt instruments. So it was maybe not exchangeable for those, but it was at the very least backed by those. And then you had this sort of Libra alliance. So what, just, I, don't, I know we're talking about reserve, but give me a minute on Libra and how you compare yeah. it to what you think. I think Libra had a lot of similarities to the reserve protocol. I, it's actually, I think, a good idea. Um, but you're right, it was kind of like a co-op of partners managing the collateral and minting and redemption. Um, and, and it was gonna be built on top of what we would probably call the largest network state uh, mm -hmm. on earth, right? Billions of users. Um, uh, and that's what scared the regulators is, suddenly an entity with influence over a billion plus people uh, could have its own currency. Uh, that was probably, they probably uh, might've been smarter to do some innovation and get some traction first. Um, but, but yeah, that's kind of where that got stopped in its tracks. Mm -hmm. um, but, but essentially, if I remember correctly, they were gonna have maybe 10 to 100 partners that were strategic liquidity partners and provided capital and kind of minting and redemption for the currency, for the Libra currency. Uh, I think it was a pretty interesting idea. Um, yeah. It's just really hard to launch those. You know, it's like if Satoshi had uh, kind of partnered with uh, something with a billion users uh, to launch Bitcoin, it wouldn't have worked, uh, right? Yeah. It probably would have been, uh, you know, maybe uh, scared a lot of people. Right. But because it came out of nowhere and it seemed really weird uh, and um, complicated, uh, no one took it serious until kind of recently. I, I remember in 2018, 2019, uh, there was like this narrative for years with Bitcoin that the government's going to shut it down and, and that it's going to get hacked and quantum computing. And it's funny that kind of just ceased uh, recently. I'd say it ceased maybe in the last three years. Um, maybe maybe it ceased in 2020. Maybe because the institutions are getting interested? 
Yeah, exactly. You know, BlackRock and the ETFs and stuff like that. You know, we just kind of got past the phase. And then, by the way, that's the same thing with the Internet, right? You know, the 90s was, uh, you know, the government's going to shut it down and, you know, it's being used by criminals. And then and then somehow we uh, all came together and said, hey, actually, we need this technology. This makes people's lives better. Yeah. Same thing with Bitcoin. Same thing with crypto uh, will play out, I believe. I I think we're, I agree with you in general. I think we're, we are going to face a quantum challenge, but I think it's, I think it can be managed. Yeah. So long as the Bitcoin community can get its act together and put it through some changes. That That's, that's not a given, given the way that community operates, but yeah. I think it's salvageable, you know, with salting and everything else. It, but it, it, yeah. the, um, one thing we skipped over is what, what, what was the inspiration or motivation for Reserve Protocol, and then how did you? What's your what's your connection to it? What's your path into it? Sure. To creating this? Yeah, uh, I was a seed investor in Reserve in 2018. Um, the project had been founded in 2017, Early. and yeah, yeah, uh, and, and they were doing a lot of research. You know, actually, Reserve they also while building a permissionless protocol, they launched a centralized app in Latin America that grew to 18 countries, 600,000 users, and over $5 billion of stablecoin volume mm -hmm. for about three or four years. Um, th they did this essentially as a prototype for asset-backed currencies, uh, focus on hyperinflation markets. They started in Venezuela and Argentina, moved on to Mexico. and Venezuela, what, when was this? Uh, it was called the Arpe app. No, sorry. When was this? When? Oh, this was, uh, let's see, 2019 to 2023. Um, sadly, 2023 mm -hmm. was Operation Choke Point, uh, which severed banking relationships with a lot of crypto businesses, yes. including this business. Uh, it, I wouldn't say severed completely, but challenged these businesses in a way that it made it fairly unsustainable, mm -hmm. um, made it very difficult to operate. And, and it's interesting too, because the team that was operating that business, you know, the government's kind of big. Um, uh, they had gotten an OFAC license for Venezuela, which had PayPal didn't even have an OFAC that's license. What I was, that's kind of what I was getting at when you saw the shock on my face for, I mean, there, there's two challenges with, Venezuela, there's the OFAC license or you know the exemption, and then that's right. the, Venezuela had pretensions for its own CBDC. Of course, you know, back in the day, oil back. I forget what it was called, like Petronas or something. So, well, I'll tell you. Here's a fun fact. Uh, so, Gabo Jimenez is uh, he's one of the uh, he heads up this project for us. Uh, well, actually, it's a separate company in the reserve ecosystem. He headed up Arpe and its successor, which is now called Ugly Cash. Uh, I'll tell you two quick stories. So uh, Arpe had to pivot. What did they pivot to? They pivoted to they pivoted from being a central, essentially Venmo or PayPal for Latin America that used stable coins, and it was pretty successful. Almost six billion dollars over five, but almost six billion dollars of stable coin volume over three or four years. Mm -hmm. um, they had to pivot the business. What did they pivot to? They pivoted to a neobank in the United States, focused in the United States, regulated in the United States mm -hmm. with stablecoin rails to Latin America. It's called Ugly Cash. Wow. Uh, go Google it, check it out. They've got killer marketing. Um, and but, but, but Gabo, you can read about him in the New York Times. So he was actually working, you know, he's Venezuelan. Uh, so he and he's a he's a decentralization maxi, he, you know, he, he he wanted to really build something mm -hmm. that would be great for his country. He, he loved his country, um, unfortunately, and he's working for I think it was President Maduro um, as they designed the stable coin, the petrodollar. Um, it became apparent to him that it was not going to be decentralized, that it was going to be run in a very sort of uh, questionable way. Uh, eventually he left the country. He had to get out uh, quickly, uh, you know, or, or they would arrest him. 
Um, this, I think this is all in the New York Times story. Don't quote me on exactly. Uh, I'll, I'll Google. I'll probably have them on the show with you. But, but it's a fascinating oh, story. Yeah, I think it's yeah. called uh, The Developer and the Dictator or something. Um, okay. Ultimately, he had to get out of the country and <clears throat> he met uh, founders of Reserve in, I think, 2018 uh, on a panel. And that's when they decided to begin working together. Really a brilliant guy um, who had the best intentions of building something great for his country. But unfortunately, um, you know, when you have dictatorships, uh, only one guy gets the vote there. And, and subsequently, they did launch a petrodollar and I, it's gone nowhere. Again, this is the problem with centralization, um, particularly in a dictatorship. Um, but but just running up on the list, we're actually the longest interview that I've ever done in okay. this new format. I just checked and I, I got another one that I might have to jump into in a minute. So just cool. Just real fast because I don't want to lose it. How did you connect up? Yeah. Uh I met I met one of the co-founders, Nevin, in 2018. I became a seed investor in reserve. 2017, 2018 was this sort of crazy time of ICOs yes. and and questionable entrepreneurs in a lot of cases. Uh, when I met Nevin, I found a, a very genuine human working on an important project. Um, you know, this idea, this focus around stable currency as a human right, uh, which I thought was really uh, interesting. Um, you. And, yeah. you know, I had invested in several projects at the time in 2022. Uh, I decided to reconnect with Nevin and, um, you know, ask them if I could uh, join the team full time and, and build out growth. And, uh, uh, you know, they accept it. And so we've been working together for almost the last two years uh, on, you know, launching on mainnet, launching on base, growing the ecosystem now at 100 million in TVL. And, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're steadily, you know, building and, uh, you know, hoping to attract more R token deployers and, and help the existing R token deployers gain use cases and integrations and, and grow their own ecosystems. This is super. And you know, I love what you said, the the human rights aspect. And you mentioned earlier before, you know, we, we take it you know, as Americans or you know, even in Dubai, we take it for granted that money is reasonably stable and accessible and movable. But I know a lot of Lebanese, and that's not the case for them. They their money's in the bank and they're never getting it out and they they go in there with a gun and they can pull out whatever they got and you know go to sent to jail. It's a real problem. So you know, it, like inflation is a slight insult to your human rights because, you know, the, your hard earned money is losing value and it's inverse, it's backdoor taxation. But they're, they're really, if you can't produce, can't earn and can't keep the benefits of what you earn, you're a slave. Mm -hmm. And I, I like the fact that you're providing a good, stable alternative to some people that maybe don't have other choices. So, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, actually very beautiful. It's it's an important mission. It's uh, and it's something it's easy to take for granted in a in a developed country. But um, yeah, we're excited to see. I, I was in Argentina a year ago. I I feel you with their with their yeah. dual rates and everything. It's like it's it's crazy. And you live there. And it, it's wild. People are doing currency exchanges with a non people showing up with a brown bag of cash. Um, the government, I guess, has uh, or the government did have kind of two different exchange rates. Yep. Uh, depending on how you wanted to get currency. I, I am kind of intrigued by what the new president is doing. You know, he's really working hard to kill the debt uh, in the country uh, and the citizens are making some sacrifices, but it, it seems promising for Argentina's future, um, you know, to get their debt spending under control, get rid of the bureaucracy. I, I, I personally, I think he's great and I hope he stays alive. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, James. So it, you know, it's it's great to have heard of you so well, so often, so long ago, and more recently, and then to have you magically appear on the show in 2024. You know, you're over there, I'm here, and here we are talking about this, and you know, common passion and everything else. I I know you're busy. I know it's early there. I saw the dawn filling coming in as you were speaking, and you know, yeah. that your room is well lit. So I, I just want to really appreciate the time that you took uh, to talk today, and it's been very informative and very great. We'll include, obviously, in the show notes, links to you and to Reserve Protocol. And for people who are interested, I'm, I'm sure you, you know, want to have conversations with them also. It sounds like there's a lot of communities that would benefit, a lot of projects and communities that would, that would benefit from a conversation with you. So yeah. I, 
appreciate thank, it. Thank you so much, Gordon. I appreciate you having me. I really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, hope to connect in Dubai soon. Uh, you, you will. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. One second.